This is The Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Now, here's Jason Jones. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to The Jason Jones Show. I am your host, Jason Jones, and today we are interviewing Kevin Sorbo. You met him as Hercules. You know him from God's Not Dead, Let There Be Light, and so many other films. In fact, being cooped up, I'm going to put his IMDb page in the show notes. Just start with his latest film and work your way down the list towards the 90s. And by the time you're done, we should be let out of our houses. It's going to be a great way to spend your lockdown. But today we're going to be talking to him about his new film, Before the Wrath, about the gospel of Jesus Christ, End Times, The Rapture. This documentary was number one on Amazon earlier this month, and I believe it's at number four right now on films. Kevin will tell you. But it was a great interview, I must say so myself, not because of me, but because Kevin is so interesting. So let's just get on with the interview. And this episode has been brought to you by Movie to Movement promoting a culture of life, love, and beauty through the power of film. Go to movie2movement.com and check out all of our movies, especially Divided Hearts of America, coming everywhere soon this fall, starring Benjamin Watson, a documentary that explores the history of abortion in America. Let's just get on with the interview. Before the Wrath, Kevin Sorbo. Aloha, Kevin Sorbo. Welcome to the Jason Jones Show. It's good to be here, and I wish I was in Aloha with you guys. Well, no, we've hung out a lot in Hawaii, and so you will be happy to know that my podcast is the biggest podcast in the world from the west side of Oahu. I love it. So you've reached the big time. You know, I did not own a TV from 1989 until 2005, but there was only one TV show that I knew existed in that time, and that was Hercules. I did not even Thank know about much. Seinfeld until 2000. Was Hercules the biggest show of the 90s? You were everywhere. We, we passed Baywatch by season three, uh, become the most watched TV show in the world in 176 countries, and I sat all seven years down there in beautiful New Zealand. And Hawaii was always a place I stopped on the way back home to L.A. since it's sort of on the way. Well, I know you, you love Hawaii. We have we've hang out here quite a bit with our families. How long has Hawaii been a part of your life? Um, I've been coming there since uh, the last year of my senior year in college. And I've been going pretty much every year. I've probably been, uh, this is just going to age me, and I probably had at least 35 trips to Hawaii through the years. When I met my wife, uh, Sam, before we got married, I said, look, every year, I try to make a trip to Hawaii for at least 10 days to two weeks after Christmas. I spend New Year's there. Um, I hope you don't have a problem with that. She didn't have a problem. With that, <laughs> no, so. I mean, who would have a, who would have a problem with that? I, I mean, that, well, that, was, I, that I, was, I had to tell I, my wife I had a 590 credit. And then what you had to tell your wife was your fiance is, you know, I, I have to go to Hawaii for 10 days a year. Well, you know, it, it was, it was just a place I've always enjoyed, always loved. Um, I, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because uh, my parents, we didn't, you know, grow up with a whole lot of money in Minnesota. So we never really traveled. I mean, the only trip we took as a family was to Brownsville, Texas, one Christmas. And Brownsville had record low temperatures. I think the highs were <laughs> in the low 50s. And the lows were like 30. And I said, my God, we just left Minnesota where it's cold like this. But uh, we just we just had bad luck with it. But we didn't have a lot of money. My dad was a school teacher on the fourth of five kids. And uh, I don't know, I just got to a point that I just, I said, I'm always going to treat myself when I can. And, and now, over the last, you know, you say, in, in drama, I mean, since Hercules in 1993, um, you know, I fly so much and I, I stay at hotels so much that I get, you know, the, the tickets to fly are free because I have so many miles. I get five coach seats and us five, you know, my wife, my three kids, and I fly. So that's free with all the miles. And then Marriott, I own so many points of Marriott that I maybe only have to spend money on three of the days over the 10 days. 
So it's uh, it, you can't afford not to go is the way I look at it. Well, what I, I love about when you and, and Sam come here, we get to hang out with our families. And your wife gave at a conservative event the most well-formed, thoughtful, conservative speech I have heard in my life. I thought, this woman needs to run for president. This woman needs to run for president right here. And She's good. Um, She's good. I, I agree with you. They, I know they bugged me for a while to do it. And I said, you know, I have zero interest in that. Let her do it. So she's not smarter than me anyway. Well, actually, she, she'd be smarter than she'd be smarter than most people in Washington D.C. Actually, and harder working and, and sharp as mm-hmm. attack, very serious. Now, I have a question: um, Are you and the producers of Before the Wrath behind this whole COVID thing? Oh, this was done a long time ago. I did <laughs> I did the voiceover. I, I know, isn't that weird? I did the narrating thing for it um, uh, about 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 seven months ago, eight months ago, and. Um, Actually, it's longer than that. It's about a year ago. And it just came out three or four weeks ago. It's been the number one number one uh, documentary on Amazon for, for all this time. So I hope people will check out Before the Wrath. On, uh, it's a pretty educated look at the book of Revelation. It's pretty fascinating. Well, what was amazing about it is, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic. And um, I, I was watching Before the Wrath. And I had been wanting to do a podcast on the rapture. And that's what it's about. It's about the end times, God's judgment, the rapture. And then I thought, aha, Kevin Sorbo is behind all of this. He's why I'm not, I have to wear a mask to go to the grocery store. So he, can, <laughs> so he can have the number one documentary on Amazon. It's either you or my poodle. My poodle has never been more happy than having the whole family in the house all the time. And her heart is going to break when the, when the lockdown is lifted. But, but as a Catholic, what I love about this documentary is – I started the segment called Dude, That's Weird because all theology is strange. Every religion, and the the strangest is actually the absence of thoughtfulness towards God or absence of thoughtfulness to the numinous. That, to me, is really the most haunting. But all sort of human um, aspirations to understand revealed religion or to understand God are strange. And so for me as a Catholic, I think our teaching on the Eucharist is, is, is very strange. And this is a documentary on what I think is the strangest teaching of evangelical Christianity, the rapture. And so I wanted to talk to you about your film. And I also, and your dog agrees with me that, that this has been great for dogs because <laughs> dad's always home. Right. But uh, I think Sam just pulled up. Uh, she was out running from there. So. Okay. <laughs> so but, uh, the dog is excited. I, what I love about podcasting is you always get the dog. Dogs are on every episode of every podcast. Ever. If you can find a podcast without a dog barking, good luck on that one. But more good than I, I, I serve my purpose. You've done your yeah. It's done. We got the, so before the wrath is a look at Revelation, the book of Revelations, Christian revealed religion, the end times, and and the rapture and this new discovery. Do we want to talk about sort of what's revealed in the film, or should they see the film and we just talk about the rapture generally? Well, I, I think, you know, just a little, little short synopsis on the film. They did a very interesting job. They, they, they interviewed scholars, present-day scholars that talk about it, and pastors and reverends and, and everybody, you know. And, and it, it came down to uh, bringing in actors as well to go back to that time, to go back to the time of, of Jesus just afterwards, just to sort of put a little bit more realistic look at 2,000 years ago and the talk of uh, the return of Jesus. So... Uh, I found it incredibly educational. I think people will love it. And I think there's a reason why it's the number one documentary on on Amazon. And actually, it reached as high as number four at one time um, for about a week there in all of its movies, next to 1917 and Frozen 2 and all that stuff. So, um, they, you know, people are looking for things like this. And, and what's amazing is that I know all these pastors and uh, clergy, everybody's got to do their, you know, they got to do, they got to do, you know, all their pastors, their, their sermons, I mean, through, uh, the internet now, but they're getting five times more people than they would normally get at church. So there's people looking for answers out there. I think ultimately we're going to have an amazing uh, silver lining in this in this uh, pandemic that's running right now. Yeah, I mean, the, our religion as Americans is in stuff and buying things and distracting ourselves, um, entertaining ourselves to death. Now you can only binge watch so much senseless nonsense. You don't even, I mean, I'm done with wanting to watch anything that's not of substance or has meaning on uh, Netflix, it got that out of my system the first week of the lockdown. And, you know, if you're addicted to being a consumer, you really have very limited options. 
And now we're forced to be still. And when we're, when the human person were made to know and love God, when we're still our sort of line of gesture, our center point is thought thinking of God. And this film does that. And um, it, it says in the film that most people today don't believe Jesus is coming. And that kind of took me aback. Is that true of just generally most Americans, do you think? Or, or have many Christians just tired of waiting for Jesus and they think it's just a social gospel? And Well, you know, I think there's a huge secular movement. There's a movement away from God. It's been going on for decades now. I mean, we, 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 tra- we train people to move away from the church through our public schools. We train them through our television movies and, and our... And I mean, our television, TV shows and our movies. We went to Europe. We were in Europe last year at this time. Obviously, if, if this happened a year ago, we wouldn't be able to go there right now. But we traveled through Europe. I was there on business, doing my business in, uh, in uh, Austria, Germany, and also in, in Belgium. And so we took a three-week trip with the kids. We traveled all through it. We go to all these amazing churches. There's no many churches anymore. Nobody go, I mean, talk about Europe as a whole in terms of, uh, being Christian, being, you know, followers and believers, um, it's just a huge spiral downward. So, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate what's going on, but I, I, I think, like I said earlier, I think that this, this whole crisis now are, make, are making people sort of take a second look. And, you, and you're right about that quiet time. You, you, we have so many distractions going on in our lives. And then with, with, I mean, the internet, with Facebook and Twitter and everything, everybody wants to be famous somehow, somewhere. Uh, oh, I have a million followers because I dance in my bedroom. You know? I mean, it's just weird. <laughs> so uh, people are still doing that. But I think there's, like you said, there's a lack of people saying, okay, I'm tired of watching this, tired of watching that. I mean, let me do something else while. And people are getting out walking around and they're getting to know their kids again. That's a good thing. I think homeschooling is going to boom here in America now because they're going to find out that their kids are going to learn more than they will at their school just, just by being at home. And uh, it's been the fastest growing segment of our education anyway, but now it's getting under attack. I've noticed some people calling it the devil's work, which I find that's interesting coming from atheist uh, secular people. Yeah, well, no, and that's the thing when you're talking about going to Europe and seeing these empty churches. Was there ever, a, I was an atheist and added, I was raised an atheist and I was an atheist till my late twenties was there. And I think how sad looking back and kind of how thin and, and, and shallow my life was that I had sort of had blinders on not to look beyond where I was told like sort of secular blinders, not to be thoughtful of God. I mean, now it's just kind of shocking that we have whole societies where people are thoughtless to where they come from, where they're going. And they just like kind of look right in front of them and do what they're told. Did you ever go through like a, a phase where you doubted or didn't believe in God? No, I, you know, I never really did. I know during my twenties, I traveled so much. I, 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 when I left Minnesota, I was in Dallas for a couple of years and I was in Europe for three and a half years living all over the place there. Then I was in Australia for almost a year and I really just bounced around and doing, doing work and doing print work and doing uh, commercial work and things like that and studying acting. But I, I, I stopped really going to church during that decade. I went a couple of times. But I didn't stop praying, and I didn't stop believing. I, always, I, I never went through a questioning phase where I said, ah, oh, there's no way there can be a God. Because I always thought, you know, something had to start this. I don't care what science is <laughs> You can't get something from nothing. And they go, well, how did God start? And I said, I don't know, but something had to start this. It wasn't just all of a sudden, boom, there's a planet. Oh, then there's a little frog. And there's, I mean, we don't have the answers for it. But you can't, you, there's no way that somebody could talk to me to believe me that something came from nothing. I'm sitting at my desk right now. Somebody built a desk, and it wasn't me, and it wasn't you, but somebody built it. Yeah, as I'm talking, you have a list of the books in order that I can look at in my line of sight that influenced me, and one of them is The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand, and I was an atheist Ayn Rand objectivist, and what was attractive to me about that book in particular and Ayn Rand was its sort of exaltation of the human person, but I never was comfortable with the atheist account of human dignity. None of them made sense to me. I knew there had to be something. And in the end, it was just the human person. You know, if something comes from, uh, you can't get something from nothing. Sure, right, of course. But when you look at any any human being on earth, na- t- take the most reprobate human being you could think of, and um, I, I'll be a gentleman and not say any names, and look at them, and you know this person did not come from nothing. 
And it's that person made in the image of God, I think, that to me, that for me was um, pointing towards God. So now as a Catholic, can I share with you some of my concerns with the rapture? Sure. So what I, what I never liked about the rapture was this idea of when the suffering comes in the end times, we get out of here. And I want, as a Christian, I kind of feel a longing to be with my friends who aren't Christians as they suffer to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ to them in that time. What would be the evangelical understanding of that? Wow. Um, <laughs> I think it's all above my pay grade. I okay. mean, you know, I know seriously. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there are going to be people left behind. Look, I'm directing and starring in the next left behind me. And um, I'm taking over the role that Nicholas Cage was in. They, they decided uh, their fans, of that Left Behind series came back and said Nick Cage didn't fit the role that it pictured for that role. So uh, the guys at Cloud 10 out of Toronto came to me. I'm directing it as well. The story is amazing. My wife goes to heaven. My son goes to heaven. I'm left behind because I was a non-believer. I'm, le- I'm left with my, so my are you daughter. So are you the pilot? Yes, I'm the pilot. So it's funny. I remember that. I never saw the movies. But when I was an atheist, I would go to Costco and I would read each of those books. I couldn't wait. I mean, there were there were a lot of them. I I think there was just one. There were a lot. I, I think like there were six. Is that true? I don't know, but that's my memory. Oh, gosh. I think there's I think there's more than that. Yeah, Jerry Jenkins was, was uh, one of the co-writers of all of them. And his son Dallas Jenkins is doing the uh, miniseries The Chosen right now, and, which I've um, heard rave. I haven't seen yet. I've heard rave reviews about. But that you know books- they raised. I'm they sorry. raised like twelve million dollars to shoot this thing off that off that crowdfunding thing, which is unbelievable. But anyway, I um I shot a movie with Dallas called What If, which I think is a better movie than God's Not Dead. Same writers that did God's Not Dead, but Fearflix did a horrific job of, of, of PR on it. They just did a bad job, and it's all about publicity. You know that. So they did not get it out there. It's done very well word of mouth since then. But if but the people out listening right now, if they're stuck at home like many people are, get What If. Great I agree with you. Movie. I think What If is a much – I loved What If. Loved it. Yeah. But that was written. That was directed by Dal Jenkins, Jerry Jenkins' son. But uh, um, I lost my train of thought. Where were we? We were just talking about, like, sort of, as a Catholic, my thought is I'd want to be here and suffer with everyone suffering. And but, because why? Why? Why would you rather do that? Uh, well, two things. I I want to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ to my family and friends, and I think there's no better time. Oh, okay. okay and sure. um, and. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's just kind of how I always thought. But probably it doesn't matter because even if there is a rapture, I'm, I'm not going anyway. <laughs> I'm sure that, you know, I, um, so God's like, well, don't, what I was gonna, don't what worry I was gonna about you. Don't worry about you, Jason. You'll be there. But what I was going to bring up with, with the, that, that uh, Left Behind movie, what's interesting is the pastor of my wife's church is Left Behind. And his ah. family, his family goes. And there's a pretty heavy scene with he and I sitting there. And that's when I finally accept Jesus. This movie shows that there is a second chance. There is a chance to sit there and come around and realize, um, you know, that, 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 you know, mistakes were made. And um, so I'm talking to the pastor and he said, you know, I lost my faith long ago. I just came up. I just said the words. I just said the words. I didn't believe them. And I think there's probably could be some reality to that. I mean, if you look at, you look at pastors today, I mean, they cave to the PC pressure, right? They're, they're afraid to, mix politics with religion when, you know, where do we get, where do we get our laws? We got our laws from the Bible for crying out loud. Of course, they're, 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 they're mixed together. I love them when they say the Democrats love all this saying uh, separation of church and state. Well, that was written by um, uh, well, That's Jefferson what... wrote that. He, and, and he didn't put it in the, it's not in the Constitution, but Jefferson wrote it. And the whole idea was to keep government out of the church. And then through the decades, they managed to switch that around and make it sound the other way around, which is not true. He didn't want any government to bother the churches. In fact, in a letter to a Baptist minister, I'm sure that's what you're referring to, he made it clear. He said, listen, I want you to understand. I want the church to penetrate the government at every level through its influence of good men. And good, you know, he was writing at the time. But that the church, the government should not penetrate the church at all. And that was Jefferson, who one could argue of all the founders, most 95% were very committed believers, and maybe he was the one that was more of a deist. Um, but even Thomas Jefferson understood that the church played an, an important role. Um, 
Yeah, it, it, it is. It is very strange. Now, when you started out in Hollywood, you were a Christian. When did you realize that your faith was going to put, um, that you'd have to be a sign of contradiction? How, you know, how long are you in the industry before you realized, oh, I have a friend, Dan Lipinski, who's in Congress. He's a Democrat. Yeah. He said it wasn't until maybe the early 2000s, mid 2000s, that being pro-life as a Democrat became an issue. When did you find out being a committed Christian in Hollywood was going to cause challenges? Well, I think before that, I think coming out, not really coming out, I've always been a conservative. The first time I could vote, I voted for Reagan. So, um, which was, <laughs> my parents weren't happy about because I grew up in Minnesota and they were hardcore. The one Hubert state Humphrey he lost. Well, the Mondale so. And Minnesota is the one but, state Reagan lost. Uh, the only state he lost. Yeah. By like by like four percentage points. Even Mondale almost lost his home state. <laughs> but Minnesota, unfortunately, has turned into California, which is just nuts. But it, but anyway, it was more of being a conservative where I started noticing, and that's probably going back 15 years now, where I started noticing a, a, a small backlash with it. And it just sort of grew and grew. And, of course, doing the uh, What If movie in 2010, which was really the first really faith-based movie I, I did. Um, and then also doing interviews and people saying that I wasn't shying away that saying I'm a Christian where, uh, you know, I got to a point with my manager and my agent about eight years ago when they said, uh, we got to part ways. And I went, why? And pretty much told me, they tried to put the blame on everybody else, but I know they were in that same camp. Well, we can't get you any auditions. We can't get, and I just look at them and go, you know, it's so funny. This is an industry that screams for tolerance and freedom of speech, but you guys are, are, are at zero tolerance and zero freedom of speech because it's all a one way street with them. So, uh, yeah, I noticed a big change at that time. And I thought, wow, how hip, how hypocritical can you get? Uh, but it is, it is what it is. And thank God for independent films because at least that way I mean, I keep going and, um, I got three movies in the can and three documentaries in the can and, you know, knock on wood, I stay busy. Yeah. Well, and that's, what's understanding when you say that, you know, people say, well, Hollywood's religion is green. That is not true because obviously they should look at everyone as you're highly marketable. You would have been someone that they should be fighting over to represent, but the reality but, is their religion isn't green. And even if it is, but, they're, they're so afraid of being judged for representing you, right? Even if they wanted to. But that's, that's just the thing. There's such a fear factor in there. And it's been built up so much through the media and through everything I said. One, I said once again, in movies and TV shows. And they're afraid. Look, when Let There Be Light came out, we opened up number two against First Green Average against Thor Ragnarok, a $300 million movie up against a $2.3 million movie. Well, Netflix calls me up right away and says, hey, we wanna, we're want thinking about opening an inspirational division here at Netflix. We see that you know, you've done so well over these last eight, nine years in these inspirational movies. We'd like to meet with you to talk about it. Well, I had a number of meetings with men person there. I've moved since then. I, live on, I, I left California. I live on Florida now. So I still have phone calls with them. But they say they want to do it, but they're still not doing it. And, you know, it's like, guys, get past your ideology. You can laugh at the 80 million households out there in America that want programming that's not in your face, that, that just good programming that their families can watch together. Why? It's called show business, not show show. Why do you deny getting that out there? And you can laugh all you want at the Christians out there. You can laugh all you want and say, what are the of bozos? Look at the money we're making off them. They won't care. They just want to see movies that have good, a good project. Look what they did with Noah. They hire an atheist director to do the story of Noah. Sam and I get invited to the premiere. It was the, it was, uh, uh, the week before it came out in theaters. So we're there and with Pepperdine University faculty members at Paramount Lodge. No, I was there with you. you. I don't know if you remember. I was, there, I was there with you guys. Well, do you, do you remember that that guy, probably the only Christian in the whole production office, Comes out and he starts apologizing for the move before the movie even starts, saying, "Now remember, this is the director's, this is his vision of that time." That was and, their their uh, line. They told us not to come out against the film. This was the director's yeah. cut. Do you remember that they were they were alluding to it was going to be much better? Yeah, and and, and it was never and, and the, it was so funny. It, after the movie, even during the movie, Sam leans over to me and my wife, my wife Sam, you know, and she says, "This isn't the story of Noah. This Transformers meets Waterworld." And I said, I told her on the way home, I said, you watch what's going to happen. The Christian crowd, the evangelical crowd, 
you're going to run out there and watch this movie because it's, it's Noah. And you got a cast, you know, with, uh, with Russell Crowe and the big visual effects. And, and I said, but next weekend, it's going to drop 60% because word of mouth is going to kill it. It dropped 62% the next weekend. <laughs> and there was a guy, if you remember, we, Sam and I are sitting way in the back. There was somebody about five rows from the front, and he raised his hand during the Q&A afterwards, and he said, do you think Hollywood will start doing more movies? Like, maybe God's not dead. And I, he didn't know I was there. The guy didn't know I was there. He said that. And the, the producer said, well, I think we'll let the independent people keep doing the movies they do, and Hollywood is doing the movies that they do. So it's like, it's amazing to me. It's well, incredible. and that movie lost so much money that I never, I don't know how much PA was spent on that film. They, I mean, it was everywhere and they bought off a yeah. lot of powerful ministries. We at Movie to Movement did something a little devious. I had my staff create a fake movie on IMDb called, <laughs> you might not want to hear this. It was called Pieces of Silver, How Paramount Pictures Corrupted the Church, the Marketing of Noah. And so we, we, we started, this was before the movie was released. We started calling all of the Christian leaders promoting the film, asking them how much they were being paid, and we were, were you concerned how Noah is portrayed as a homicidal environmentalist lunatic, and that the Nephilim yeah. the ark, and does it bother you that he blesses his children with the sin, the skin of Lucifer? <laughs> I mean, there was yeah, the, <laughs> this film was oh, they, so they had, bad. They had, they, they had to put in global warming even back then. Oh, they're gonna love me because I've got one of my three documentaries. One, one before the wrap. The other one is Climate Hustle, too, that I narrate, and I'm on camera with, too. They show the other side of the issue and bring up bring up real facts and real truth about the so-called global warming climate change. So I'm going to be endearing myself even more to the uh, paranoid uh, people who are killing the earth and all that kind of stuff. You know, thank you for doing well, – Kevin, I want to thank you for your Twitter, for your career, for – you just your joy and your, your, your stand up courageously, you and your wife. And that has to help to have a wife who's with you shoulder to shoulder in all of this. And in now your children, your, your son has this uh, TikTok that's blowing up that inspired my son to start making TikTok uh, videos. Um, but, you know, this climate hustle movie is going to be very important. And this COVID crisis. I just wrote an article last week called Flatten the Hunger Curve. Hunger is the number one killer in the world. A lot of these environmental yeah. reg regulations. Hello. <laughs> right. Exactly. The number one, you know what the number one killer in the world, number two killer is? Uh, heart disease. Tyrannic, flu. Tyrannical governments. Yeah. There so you go. Uh, food insecurity, number one. Direct violence from the state against its own people, number two. And the COVID crisis been, has been used to exacerbate both of those problems. And the opportunity maybe that this COVID crisis will be able to give you in your film is what global warming is doing almost imperceptibly, the, the, call, you know, the global warming regulations is doing almost imperceptibly, increasing food insecurity, uh, imposing uh, government controls over stealing civil liberties. Like in Hawaii, you can't have plastic straws to drink your smoothie. That's insane. Uh, now all the restaurants in Hawaii have to use paper products uh, um, for their to-go orders. It's going to be very challenging and very expensive for a lot of businesses. They're going to go out of business. What global warming regulations, quote-unquote global warming regulations, are doing in slow motion, I mean, COVID is d doing overnight. I think we're going to have massive food insecurity in the next uh, 90 to 120 days. And hopefully, one of my hopes is that this scam and the tragedy, that's, the cure is worse than the disease, it'll help people understand that the cure for quote-unquote climate change is worse than whatever disease there is or isn't. Because I think that the biggest cause of climate change is that big, shiny thing you shouldn't look at in the sky. Of course. It's called weather. Look, <laughs> I'm, all for the green, I'm all for the green movement. I'm all for I'm all for electric cars, like blah, 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 blah. But I get tired of the hypocrisy of people attacking fossil fuels and oil. But then maybe they should go online and find out that computer they're going online has oil products in it. Their, their cell phones, oil products, their clothes, their toothbrush, their hair brush. Get rid of everything they have in their house that has oil products in them and really live, li you know, live the life. Show us the way how we should live our life to get rid of oil. I mean, th it's, just, it's just so weird to me. I mean, this, the hypocrisy reeks, and it comes down to being uneducated and ignorant about getting educated. And uh, they're, they're totally led blind, blindly by hysteria of the government and our tv and movies and uh, you know look this this virus is bad yes it's bad 
but so is the flu. We've had the flu for how long? Forever. And how many people die a year in America? 80,000? Why aren't we wearing masks all the time and practicing social distancing? They, the flu changes every year and they give a different flu shot, yet 80,000 people a year still die from it. How many people are dying from AIDS still? How many people are dying from starvation? 2,000 2, I mean, a day in the world. 2,000 people die yeah. from AIDS in the, in the world every day. It's unbelievable. I mean, the, the only thing that fears is fear itself, as FDR said. One of the few things I agree with it on. So it's the, like, let's wake up. Let's wake up, you know, let's not let the government control our lives the way they control it. Well, there are many people doing more to wake people up in the world. I think a lot of it than you. I think a lot of it is if you give a dog a bone, he can't bark or bite. So you have us fussing on the uh, global warming. Meanwhile, you're from Minnesota. I mean, the, the, because of these family farms being sold to corporate farms now in Wisconsin and Minnesota and other places, they're having a real problems with their rivers, lakes, and streams. The environmentalists aren't talking about the dirt the air, the water anymore. They're talking about, they're obsessed with one thing, plant food. And you brought up computers. You know, they, we, we talk about all sorts of things. We don't talk about the direct human cost that you and I, I have three Apple products. And we know all these big companies and brands are partnering with the Communist Party of China that has enslaved 3 million Uyghurs. Uh, and in my interview today, I just interviewed the Prime Minister for East Turkestan on the plight of... 3 million Uyghurs in Chinese-occupied East Turkestan in concentration camps, doing slave labor, making products that you and I buy, all of us buy. The media doesn't talk about that because it may be because it just doesn't, it's not good to put advertising around human beings in concentration camps. Maybe it's easier to sell, you know, uh, apple juice in between um, stories on polar bears on my, melting icebergs. Um you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> which, which, which is false, too, but people no. don't want to hear that either. <laughs> but it's pretty, but it's so picturesque. Oh, and you can sigh a little bit, but you don't really care. But if you saw, you know, elderly Uyghur behind bars or being tortured, well, that's not, you're going to change the channel, you know? Yeah. And maybe they just yeah. don't want anything in the news that will cause us to change the channel. So global warming is the one, It's I call it social justice junk food. If you consume it, you won't be doing social justice that needs to be done, standing with the most vulnerable from the child in the womb to the Yazidi in East Turkestan, I mean, in, to the Yazidi in Iraq or the, the Uyghur in East Turkestan. So, so uh, Kevin, how do people follow you? I want, I want everyone to, this is the film, because I know all of us are tired of my family. We had fun binge watching for a week. We're over it. And now we're desperately seeking something good to watch as a family. There is nothing better for you to watch as a family now than before the wrath you can get it at amazon where else can you get it um just go online you can order at the dvd i mean the before the wrath.com they give you all kinds of information i also want them to watch we mentioned what if we mentioned god's not dead is another great one my last movie let there be light that i directed that was in theaters a little over a year ago is was great it's a great movie doing very well let there be light great family movie Abel Field, another one of my favorite movies. I shot over 64 movies. There's probably about a dozen I wish I didn't do, but, you know, you don't know they're going to turn out bad. So basically, doing. no, that's a good point. Just go to, I'm going to put in the show notes your IMDb and just start now and work your way down your IMDb. You know what my family, I have to go confess, to because I did not own a TV because I was in the military and in college from 89 to 2005. We, we started watching Hercules. Two weeks ago. Awesome. We added it to our, no. what we're going to watch. Yeah, my wife and I. We sure your, did. Your, your kids your kids will love that. Yeah, no, we watched it with them. Yeah, because we're doing Greek mythology. We homeschool. So it was yeah. actually my wife's idea. She said, honey, we should we should start watching Hercules. So that's what we've done. And um, and, uh, and it's, I don't it's even know fun. how. Many... There's, always a good, there's always a good message in there for the most part. I mean, they're, they're, the writers, I got to have my hats off. They always. Well, they did on purpose now. There's always good moral messages in Hercules. And I got letters from all around the world from people saying, you know, hey, we love it. Look, I do this, these video things from Cameo. They go to Cameo.com slash K Forbes. That's Cameo.com slash K Forbes. I do video messaging to people. And it's amazing. I'm doing about 15 a day right now because I think people are just like, hey, I want to get a message from Kevin Sorbo. Send it to my dad, who I can't go see now. And it's been interesting, the response from people, but they all say the same thing. This is a show I grew up watching with my dad or my mom or my grandpa, and they have good memories about it because it was a fun show. But I, I, I'm going to throw out 
Um, let's be light again too, but they can go to kevinsorbo.net. They can get all kinds of information that way as well. They can actually order merchandise. They want autographed copies of my book. My latest book, True Faith, just came out. It's a follow-up of True Strength. So people can get True Faith as well. Well, I can't thank you, Kevin. Now, so you know, this audience, about half our audience is outside the country. We have a very large audience in the Middle East and in Africa. And so hopefully we're going to get a lot of sales out there as well. But on, on Thursday, I'm guest hosting the Alex Jones Show, which has a huge audience. And they would love to hear about Before the Wrath. You think you can have a half hour for me to come on the Alex Jones Show on Wednesday? I mean, I'm sorry, on Thursday? Thank you. Sure. All right, brother. I'll, I'll, I'll text you or email you so we can set it up. And oh, last thing, how do we, we follow you on Twitter? Because I love your Twitter. Uh, it's uh, um, KSORB, K-S-O-R-B-S. KSORB. For some reason, somebody took my last name, Sorbo. So I, I did my nickname. The kid oh, I was called me as a kid growing up. So that, that, that's KSORB. So um, people can definitely go on there and find me as, as well. And by the way, this Thursday uh, night, my wife and I are doing a date night with Sam and Kevin Sorbo. So they can go to homegrowngeneration.com slash date. That's homegrowngeneration.com slash date. 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Thursday. The date night oh. with Kevin and Sam Sorbo. We're going to talk about uh, tickets to joy-filled marriage. Like we have, we have all the secrets, but we're, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about all the great uh, ups and downs and how you get through marriages with uh, with a strong faith. Well, you know, I, I uh, a mentor of mine said you can judge a man by his family, and I have spent time with you and your wife and your children, and I know you're a great man, and you have some secrets to teach all of us. And I'm glad that's going to be right after the Alex Jones show, because his audience is very responsive. Uh, my first time on a show, I sold over 200 copies of my book, which was unbelievable for me. And I have to imagine, and I don't know what your date is going to be. My wife just wanted to go on a date with me yesterday, and uh, I'm sure it's better than that. I said, well, what do you want to do? There's nothing we can do. Well, every weekend, I go to the dump because we only have, you know, we're only allowed one little garbage can for my family. We have 10 people living in this house. And so it's a big thing for me to load up the truck and <laughs> go to the garbage dump. <laughs> Oh, I was like, can I come to the garbage dump with you? And so that was our big date. So I hope your date night's a little better than a trip to the garbage dump. Well, this is this is a video one. People can talk to us. We can we can have a nice chat. So April twenty third. That's just coming up on Thursday. So I hope people can join us and uh, that that have a have a great night hanging out doing that. And uh, I have two books: True Faith and True True Faith and True Strength. So I hope people uh, I hope people order those books. They can go online and get it. They can go to kevinturbo.net and get an autographed copy on either True Faith or True Strength or both of them. The show notes are going to be full. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin Sorbo, for coming on the Jason Jones Show. All right, buddy. Take care. All right. Aloha, Kevin. Guys, what a Aloha. great interview. What a great interview. What a great man with so much wisdom, <laughs> such a beautiful career. I'm going to fill up the show notes with uh, all those links that we talked about. This has been another episode cool. of the Jason Jones Show, brought to you by Movie to Movement, creating a culture of life, love, and beauty through the power of film. Till tomorrow, aloha. This has been the Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Ooh.